If you have your Bibles this morning, join me in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5 and verse 10. We'll read it in the King James and then the NLT. We've been doing a series on finding purpose in the midst of discomfort and pain. And we've discovered that the purpose of discomfort and pain is for God to allow it to show up in our lives so that we can mature and grow as a result of it. You're not going to experience growth living your whole life in the comfort zone. That's not how it works, which is why Bible is very clear when he says, they that live godly shall suffer persecution. So think it not strange when it happens. And a lot of times Christians think it's a strange thing for me to be born again, to give my heart to Jesus, for me to go to church and, and I'm suffering trials and persecution and pain and discomfort. Discomfort is designed to hold up a mirror in front of your soul, not to show you what you think you are, but to show you who you really are. Discomfort shows you the attitude that you have. Discomfort shows you the thing that you would not say of yourself, but it may be true of yourself. And there are a lot of things that grow out of discomfort, a lot of maturity that comes out of discomfort. Not saying that God is the one that's putting the pain and the trials on you, but he has certainly taken advantage of it. Even when Jesus came to the earth, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So whether you think God does, brings the pain or the discomfort or not, discomfort is used to mature you and to grow you. And ultimately, the objective of maturing and growing us is so that we can be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. What he is saying is, is that I am going to use life, and I'm going to use the things that come as a result of life, and I'm going to use it if you will depend on me. I'm going to use it if you'll trust me. I'm going to use it if you'll stay with me that throughout these different temptations, testing, and trial, you will notice that you will become more and more and more like Christ, more and more and more become, uh, be being conformed into his image. So that's, that's the result. The, the, the result and the objective is to be molded and shaped in the image of Jesus Christ. So we've got to rearrange our thinking about what we think about the gospel. <laughs> you know, somebody says, well, you know, I'm saved, but most of us got saved coming through the door of hell. In other words, somebody told you that if you don't get saved, you're going to hell, so you got saved. But boy, this is so much more than what religion has ever explained to us. So we begin today, I want to talk to you about grace and faith in the midst of discomfort. In other words, am I just supposed to stay there and take it because I realize that I'm going, the objective is to be molded into the image of Christ? No, you're not going to throw away your faith. I'm going to show you how to move in faith in the midst of discomfort, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of temptations and trials. What you should be doing while all of that molding and shaping is taking place in your life. First Peter chapter 5 and 10 in the King James says, but the God of all grace who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while. Now notice something's going to come after the suffering. After you have suffered a while, he'll make, he'll, it'll, it'll make you perfect, establish, establish, strengthen, and it will settle you. The uh, New Living Translation says this, 1 Peter 5, he says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory. How has he called us to share in his eternal glory? By means of Christ Jesus. So it's going to be by Christ Jesus that we accept the calling to share in his glory, by Christ Jesus. 
So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore. Notice what happens after the challenge, after the trial, after the discomfort. He says, you, you, will, you will be restored. So restoration comes. You will have support. He says, you'll be strengthened, and he will place you on a firm foundation. Restoration, support, strength, and a firm foundation. But notice all of that comes out of that place of discomfort. So you don't want to run away from discomfort. You don't want to be deceived about discomfort, thinking that that's just not going to be a part of you. And somehow, as a Christian, if you experience discomfort, then you must be doing something wrong. But if you find your, uh, uh, your, yourself in discomfort, then maybe God doesn't love you anymore. Or maybe you're being judged for something you did or you said. Now, I don't make light that sometimes we cause discomfort by what we do, <laughs> you know. But then we've got to understand that there's a place of discomfort and there is purpose that can be found even in the midst of discomfort. So I submit to you this morning that suffering is the catalyst. It's the stimulus. It is the encouragement, the thing that encourages Christ-likeness. It's the things that we go through, the place of discomfort that encourages or stimul stimulates this Christ-likeness. And so you understand something, that a guy who's in, 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 uh, in the weight room trying to develop muscle, you cannot develop muscle without enough weight to tear down your muscle tissue. The way muscle is developed is you tear down the muscle tissue, break it down as much as possible, and then you spend time resting it, nourishing it, and then when it, it's being restored and it grows back stronger and bigger. That's how it happens, okay? And so the same thing is true where life is concerned. You go through certain pressures in life and situations in life, and some of them break you down pretty, 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 pretty much. They break you down. But you've got to understand that out of that, there's going to come the replenishment. There's going to come the nourishment. There's going to come the strengthening. There's going to come a firm firmness about you. There's going to be something about you that was in you, but you hadn't seen it yet, that through all of that pressure brought it forth. You see, all of us have muscles in our body. You just can't see some of y'all muscles because it hasn't been developed. And what God wants is he wants to develop the stuff that's on the inside of you that you were born with, that you were wired with, that he put on the inside of you, and he wants to develop it so you can, you can use it in this thing called life, praise God. So don't run away every time pressure shows up in your life. Sometimes you've got to face pressure with your head up and say, bring it on, devil, bring it on. You ain't going to do none but make something good out of me. You ain't going to do none but help reveal something in me that I didn't know I had. I was, I was recently looking at the movie Mortal Kombat. Now, I know some of y'all think that's sin and the devil, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> and, and, and while I was looking at Mortal Kombat, when they were choosing Earth's greatest fighters, they all had a special power, but it would only show up in intense suffering. And one guy, his wouldn't show up because he was just really cool in his demeanor, and, you know, they could beat him, they could do and, and his power wouldn't show up. But when they started messing with his wife and kid, and he thought they were on the line, that was intense, that was suffering, and all of a sudden his power came out that's exactly what God is doing with us. You are wired with something so awesome, something so supernatural. There's something about you that nobody else can be quite like you when that anointing shows up on your life. And I prophesied that there's an anointing getting ready to show up on your life. All these crazy days are doing is drawing out of us what's been in us the whole time. Are, are you listening to me now? Jesus suffers now with us even though he already suffered for us. That's kind of Jesus he is. He suffered with us even though he's already suffered for us. And he will be with you. That's the thing that comforts me. All right, all right, God, whatever, whatever, as long as you're there with me. As long as you are with me, and he promised I will not leave you 
and never will I forsake thee. All right, let's move a little longer, look, look down the road here. Romans chapter 8, 29. So we want to look at faith in this and grace and how it, it, how it shows up. Romans 8, 29 says this. He says, uh, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Every one of us are headed towards this place, conforming to the image of his son. And we're conforming out of all the trials and the things that life brings at us. They're conforming us. They are molding us into the image of his son. The Bible promises that when Jesus comes back, we will be like him. God has accepted the responsibility for our transformation. Well, that gives me great peace to know I don't have to do it. He promised that at the end of it, I will not allow you to continue what he said. I won't allow you to continue what I started. See, God started the good work in you. He promised to finish it. Oh, my God. When will it be finished? He says, on the day when Jesus returns. All right, so notice again, he says, uh, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Why? That he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren, because it was prophesied that he would be the firstborn amongst many brethren. So we got to have some brethren. That means sister in two. All right? And so how is he going to do this? How is this confirmation going to take place? Philippians 3 and 10. Philippians 3 and 10. Now, this is big. I, I need you to get a hold of this. Philippians 3 and 10. This is going to be a strong, strong teaching session. I'm going to sow this in you. So if you came here to do some cartwheels and run around, you know, I don't know if you're going to get a chance to do that or not. I got to put something in you so your cartwheels can be meaningful. <laughs> if you're going to shout, shout with something. Don't just holler and still stay ignorant. <laughs> Amen. If you're going to run, run with something. Don't be running, jumping, shouting, hitting people next to you, and you ain't got nothing to use the same way as you was when you came in here. At least get some if you're going to hit me while I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> now, watch this. This is, this is good. That, that I might know him. This is Paul. That I might know him and that I might know the power of his resurrection. And Paul said that I might also know the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. This phrase st stood out, the fellowship of his suffering. What's that? The fellowship of his suffering. Over the years, I've seen people try to define that, and <laughs> there are people on Easter who try to get on cross and say, look at me, I'm, I'm sharing in the fellowship. That's, that's not the fellowship of his suffering. One reason why is your blood can't do what his blood did. Amen. It should have been me on that cross. No, it should not. If it had been you on that cross, we'd be in a mess right now. <laughs> so quit saying that. That's not, that's why. The fellowship of his suffering. The word suffering, uh, the word fellowship comes from an old uh, Greek word, konania, which is a giving and a receiving relationship. It's a giving and a receiving relationship. It, it, in other words, it's, it's um, you have a part in that fellowship, okay? And, and, and Jesus has a part in that fellowship. It's like when you fellowship one with another, it takes two releasing their parts in order for that to be the fellowship. If you're fellowshipping with somebody and you're doing all of the talking, that's not a fellowship. That's a painful ship. <laughs> Nobody wants to sit down and listen to you do all the talking. It's a fellowship. It's a giving and a receiving relationship, okay? All right, so what, it, what he talks about, the fellowship of his suffering, let's look at the parts. Jesus' part of this fellowship of suffering was he died, he took all of our sins, he was beat with a cat of nine's tail, he was crucified on a cross, nailed to a cross, went to hell, and then on the third day he got up and said, all right, now it's time for your part. So he took the, the worst part of the fellowship of the suffering. So he died, went through all of the suffering he went through, and obtained the victory through his suffering. Out of his suffering came the victory of us having a right to salvation, of us having a right 
to this new covenant, of us having a right to be free from sins, of us having the right to be redeemed and all of those things. That was his part of the fellowship of suffering. Now that he has been raised from the dead, has taken his seat on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, because now the other part of the fellowship of the suffering is left up to you and me. So what's our part? His part was to suffer to obtain the victory. Our part is now to maintain the victory in the midst of the suffering that's trying to take from us what Jesus presented to us. So that means I am saved because of what Jesus did, and circumstances of life are trying to take that from me, and I'm like maintaining it. You ain't taking it from me. I'm restored, and the sufferings of life and the trials and the temptations of life are trying to attack my identity and take it from me, but I'm maintaining. I am, I am, uh, uh, I, I'm prosperous in every area, and all of the stuff in life is trying to take from me that prosperous, take from me my healing, take from me my, I'm already delivered, but there's some addiction that's trying to rob me of my deliverance. There's some sickness trying to rob me of my healing. So my job is to stand there for. And I am to stand there while all hell trying to take it from me. And sometimes it looked like he about to knock me off my mark, but like a slinky, I come right back to where I am. Some of y'all don't know what a slinky is, but some of y'all remember. I come back right, I recall right back. Oh, Lord, I think I am sick and I'm going to die. Oh, that, no, I'm healed. Oh, Lord, I don't know how to pay this bill. I don't know if I'm ever going to be prosperous. I don't know how much, and now Jesus already took care of that. My job is to maintain it. My job is not to get it. My job is to keep it, praise God. My job is not, to, my job is not to go and try to, you know, do what Jesus did. So the suffering's coming to try to move you off the victory that Jesus did in his part and I'm not going to fail him in my part. Well, I stand if something happens. No, I'm going to stand if don't nothing happen. See, you got to understand, we're, we're so result-oriented, and there's nothing wrong with expecting results, but it's got to go deeper than the results. There's got to be something about you and Jesus' fellowship that says, I'm not going to let you down. I, I'm doing this because I believe in you. I'm saying this because I believe in you. I'm not making my confession whole because I believe my confession will bring about my possession. Now, if I confess it and possess it, praise God. But see, the problem with that is I, I have already possessed it before I confessed it. I, I, I'm already believing that I receive what he has done. So I possess it right now. My confession shouldn't bring me to the place of understanding that I possess it. It is what Jesus has done and my belief in what Jesus has done that has brought me to the place where I know I already got it. So when you hear me say what I already got, it's not so I can get what I already got. I'm saying it because that's what I believe. That's what I believe. I believe that I'm saved. I believe that I'm healed. I believe that I'm prosperous. Are you following what I'm saying? Let, let, let me, let, let, it's, it's a scripture for that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, let me read it in the King James. And this is something that we need to talk about. We keep doing stuff because we're trying to get what, we, what Jesus already got for us. And our job is to believe that he got it and then to maintain it. Not maintain it if I see it. Not maintain it if I got it. Not maintain it if my circumstances change. Some things are not, you're, some things you're not going to see the result of until you get to heaven. Do you know that? And I'm all right with that. I ain't got to see everything while I'm alive. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm not doing it so I can see it. I'm doing it because my job is to maintain what he did. And if he did his job, I sure ain't going to let him down on doing my job. 
Notice, he says, we have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, he says, and therefore I've spoken. He says, I believe it. That's, I'm saying it because I believe it. We also believe, and therefore we speak. Notice what's moving my speaking is what I believe. Look at the NLT. Look at the NLT. Now, some folks going to write me letters. Yeah, Brother Dollar, I don't read them letters. Don't send them to me. Keep your paper. Keep your paper. Well, I'm going to send you a digital paper. I ain't going to check in no comments. I'm, I'm just preaching what I believe God told me to preach. I got to be accountable for what he tell me to preach, praise God. I can't preach what I think everybody going to approve of. That's why I had to get delivered from approval addiction, because when you are looking for people's approval, you won't be able to serve God. Let me slow down, because y'all think I'm fussing. I'm just excited. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believe in God, so I spoke. I believe in God, so I spoke. I told you that day, I think it was last week, where my hip did something, and uh, then that movement in my back, and then and I must have been dehydrated, and then the cramps came. I told you it was them kind of cramps where your little toes start crossing and the other toes start crossing, and you'd be trying to stop by doing that, you know, and then it got, when I did that, got in my calf, and, 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 and Taffy and, and Alex were on their way home, and I'm, I'm stuck in the hallway. And I shouted out to my loudest, I am healed whether I feel it or not. I'm not saying this to feel it. I'm saying this because I believe it. Yeah. 